Welcome one and all to the triumphant live stream. We're so glad that you could be a part of this experience once again. God is good, greatly to be praised. Before we get started, would you bow your heads with me and let us pray. God, we bless you, we worship you, we honor you, we give you all the glory and all the honor in this moment. We pray that you will visit us in this house and in every house today. Your presence will be manifested and you will be made known. Touch each and every one, heal, deliver, set free, open hearts, save and change lives. We ask this in your name and we say, amen. Well, it's time for worship. Let's go. Oh, oh, oh. 
at this moment, God, we just offer up worship to you with a heart full of gratitude. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm never going back. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm never going back. My response.
so glad that he's rescued us, that he set us free, that he's made a way for us. Even in the midst of a pandemic, he has rescued our life. In the midst of racial turmoil, we have been rescued. And our response today is hallelujah. It's always important not only to know that God has done something great for you, but it's also important to respond. We respond by faith in Him. We respond in our worship. Part of our worship is when we lift our hands, when we clap our hands, when we sing, when we dance, but the book of Romans says our most reasonable act of worship is when we give our whole lives to him as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. And our entire life includes worship in our giving when we give of our substance. You see, when you love someone, you have no problem giving to them. It is an act of love and an act of worship in giving. Today, I want you to respond to all that God has done, to, done for you. Not just in singing or dancing or anything else, but in your giving today. I'm going to give you a moment to get your gift together. And if he's really rescued your life, I want you to sow into this moment, just as Abraham did after he was rescued. Let's make a sacrifice today, willingly and cheerfully. Well, I usually sacrifice through Givelify. You can do the same as well, or you can give through PayPal. You can give through our website, ttcog.com, or you can just drop it off right here at 7 Sutter Avenue. Are you responding today? Well, say these words with me as we declare. As I move towards a triumphant life, as I, move towards a triumphant life I accept all supernatural concepts and ideas That God, has for me that God has for me to bring me to my destiny. To bring me to my destiny. I sow triumphantly. I sow triumphantly. I reap triumphantly. I reap triumphantly. I give triumphantly. I give triumphantly. I live triumphantly. I live triumphantly. God bless you. My response is hallelujah, you're my redeemer, hallelujah, sing my response. My response is hallelujah, hallelujah. you're my
Well, there's such a sweet anointing in the house of God this morning, and uh, the presence of God is truly here. And we just want to welcome you again to the Triumphant Church of God. Today is a special day as we're honoring and saluting our fathers. And so at this time, I just want to take um, the opportunity to honor my spiritual father, our uh, Bishop Eric McLeod. Uh, I want to uh, um, pay respects to my pastors, Pastor Watson, Pastor Richards, Pastor Lindsay, uh, the members of the Triumphant Church of God, and our uh, Facebook audience, uh, audience on YouTube, and on our tr um, website, ttcog.com. Welcome again to the Triumphant Church of God. As I said, today is an extra special day. It's Father's Day, and we're going to be celebrating our fathers. Uh, today, across America and some con other countries, uh, they're celebrating Father's Day. Um, since 1922, the third Sunday of, of June has been set aside to honor and to pay tribute to our fathers. So today we salute the fathers. Uh, today I salute my father uh, all the way in Trinidad who is a great father and a great provider. Um, a, a small boy, um, he, his, the, when asked the definition of a father, he said it's just like, a, it's just like Mother's Day, you, only you don't spend as much. Um, and I thought it was really funny, and, and it's actually true because fathers don't get the accolades that mothers do, and Father's Day isn't nearly as big as Mother's Day. Uh, the florist isn't overwork, um, card sales aren't nearly as profitable, restaurants are half-filled, and church attendance are pale, pale in, in comparison. Uh, but on Father's Day, uh, we tend to talk about absentee fathers, deadbeat dads, statistics are recited, and we lay on the guilt uh, for not being there um, for their children. And we have gone, uh, sometimes we have gone so far to identify single mothers as fathers. And I understand the notion of a single mother supposedly taking on the role of a, a mother and a father. Uh, um, but be, uh, being a single mother myself, um, we are complimented for doing an amazing job, but we are not fathers. And, and according to the, God's original plan for a man and a woman, a woman was not designed to successfully adopt the role of a father. Um, the father paints the image of God on his child, and, and the child's relationship with God is generally derived from their relationship um, with their father. Uh, so, so why are we honoring fathers today? Well, one reason why we are honoring fathers is because of the meaning of the word father. In the verb form, the word father means the founder, to be the foundation, and to author. So you fathers are the authors of your home, and God wants you to author a God-loving, God-fearing, and God-honoring home. It, it seems to me, though, that the young fathers are making a concerted effort to become more exceptional fathers. Maybe be it's because they don't like what they see on the television, or maybe because your, their fathers has not been around and they are determined to do better. I also think, though, that some fathers have a more focused mo uh, motivation. They are concerned about the moral decay, decay of the culture, and so they are also concerned about the temptations that face their children on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but on Father's Day, uh, like every other day, uh, there is no better place um, for us to turn to to honor um, our fathers than to the Word of God. So I'm going to ask you right now to turn with me to the book of St. Luke. Um, St. Luke chapter 15, and we're going to be reading from verses 11 to 24. And I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation, so you can follow along. And the Word of God reads, Then Jesus said, Once there was a father with two sons. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think it's time to give me the share of your estate that belongs to me? So the father went ahead and distributed among the two sons their inheritance. Shortly after, the younger son packed up all his belongings and traveled off to see the world. 
he journeyed to a far off land where he soon wasted all he was given in a binge of extravagant and reckless living. With everything spent and nothing left, he grew hungry, for there was a severe famine in the land. So he begged a farmer in the country to hire him. The farmer hired him and sent him out to feed the pigs. The son was so famished, he was willing to eat the, the slop given to the pigs because no one would feed him a thing. Humiliated, the son finally realized what he was doing, and he thought, there are so many workers in my father's house who have all the food they want with plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop? I want to go back home to my father's house, and I will say to him, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I will never be worthy to be called your son. Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. So the young man set off for home. From a long distance away, his father saw him coming, dressed as a beggar, and great compassion swelled up in his, in his heart for his son, for he was returning home. So the father raced out to meet him. He swept him up in his arms, hugged him dearly, and kissed him over and over with tender love. Then the son said, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me be. The father interrupted and said, Son, you are, now, you are home now. Turning to his servants, the father said, Quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe. I will place it on his shoulders. Bring me the ring, the seal of sonship, and I will put it on his finger. And bring all the best shoes you can find for my son. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For this beloved son of mine was once dead, but now he's alive again. Once he was lost, but now he is found, and everyone celebrated with overflowing joy. Father, it's in the precious name of Jesus that I give you thanks for your word today. And I ask you that let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. The parable states a certain man had two sons. And the majority of the parable speaks of the younger of the two sons. But the older son or the older brother is clearly and importantly addressed at the end of the parable. But for the purpose of this message, I will be focusing on the younger son. And if I should ascribe a topic uh, to this text, it would be a father's heart. A father's heart. There is no perfect father except one. And I believe the parable that we commonly call the parable of the prodigal son is really the picture of a father's heart. Today, the idea of true fatherhood is hard to define. The world has turned the definition of father upside down. We have fathers who abuse their children. We have the divorce that hurts the family, and then the fathers stop supporting their children or even seeing their children. We have kids who don't know their father. And then you have fathers that are workaholics and don't spend much time with their children. This has given the world a hurt and pain when people hear the word father. And in Christian life, it is compounded even more because we, we describe God as our father. And when we use the word to describe God, for many, it conjures up bad images because the way their father has been. And kids these days start to think that of God as an unloving and an unconcerned God. God is not that way at all. We see him constantly portrayed as the greatest father that has ever been. So for the next few minutes, I would like to invite you to observe with me Eight qualities of a father through the lenses 
of the scripture. And the first quality of the father is, the father is approachable. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think it's time to give me a share of my estate that belongs to me? So the father went ahead and distributed among the two sons their inheritance. Obviously, the son felt comfortable approaching his father. And although the request may not have been appropriate, nevertheless, the son, motivated by foolishness and greed, felt comfortable in approaching his father. In those days, a father could either grant the inheritance before or after his death, but it was usually done after. So when the son approached his father and asked for an inheritance, uh, when he requested a portion of his inheritance, in essence, what he was saying, I wish you were dead. Uh, So the question is to you fathers, are you approachable? Can your daughter or can your son approach you? Does your child feel comfortable coming to you with suggestions? Or are they scared of of you? Would you shut them down or would you ridicule them? Or call them unpleasant unpleasant names? Or would you listen to them? The question this morning to the fathers is, are you approachable? We are talking about the heart of a father. The second quality of the father is, the father is amendable. The father knew that the son made a foolish and greedy request. Yet, he was open-minded and allowed him to go his way nevertheless. The father clearly illustrates God's love. See, God and his love, he will allow rebellion and in some sense respected human will. So the question to the fathers this morning is, are you amendable? Are you adaptable? Are you flexible? Are you willing to to forego your opinions? Are you willing to listen to your child's requests? And sometimes our children may come to us with some, what we perceive as strange ideas or requests. And are you willing to forego your standpoint or your biases and try to understand your child's perspective? Or is it your way or the highway? Are you, fathers, amendable? The third quality of the father is, the father is attached. To be attached to someone or something is to be emotionally involved. And the scripture says, shortly after receiving his inheritance... The son packed up all his belongings and traveled off to see the world. He journeyed to a far off land, far away from his family. In other words, he disconnected. He wanted to break all family ties. And although the son had physically disconnected himself from the father, the father heart stayed connected to the son. The father remained emotionally involved, and most likely he did so in prayer and daily meditation. And oftentimes, church, we quote scriptures that affirm a mother's emotional bond to her child, such as Isaiah 49 verse 15, where it says, Can a mother forget the sucking child that she will not, uh, com- she will not have compassion on the son of her womb? And fathers usually get a bad rap for not being emotionally involved in their children's lives. And they are deemed as emotionally detached. But in all fairness, church, typically in some cultures, the fathers are not taught to express their emotions. They're encouraged to suppress their emotions. And supposedly that as a male, if a male express their emotions, they are considered or they are viewed as, as being weak. So therefore, in some societies, we are plagued with emotionally detached boys, young men, and ultimately fathers. And when these young men become fathers, they struggle to attach or to remain attached to their children. Nonetheless, we should not misjudge the father's heart. 
Fathers may not be as demonstrative as their mother, as mothers, but they are attached. They are emotionally attached in their own unique way. So I just want to encourage the fathers this morning because I know the fathers oftentimes get a bad rap about being so cold, being so callous, and not able to attach, emotionally attach. But in essence, a lot of times our fathers, because of their bringing, they were never oriented, they were never taught how to be emotionally attached. The scripture reminds us, we may recall that a perfect, holy, sinless Jesus took on the sins of the world and our sins nailed him to the cross. And the Bible states, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani. And that is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that moment, Jesus felt abandoned. You see, Jesus had known great pain and suffering both physically and emotionally during his life. But he had never known separation from his father. And at that moment, he experienced what he had not yet experienced, an emotional detachment. And at this moment, a holy transaction took place. Because God the Father regarded God the Son as if he were a sinner. And as the Apostle Paul would later write, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The father in the parable clearly demonstrates God's attachment to his children. According to Romans 8 verses 38 and 39, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, no height, no depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I'm talking about the heart of a father this morning, church. The heart of a father is emotionally connected to his child. The fourth quality of a father is the father anticipates. The heart of a father patiently waits for the rebellious son or daughter to return home. The father prayerfully waits with patient expectation to see that son or that daughter again. And the father anticipates good things. He is hopeful. And when the prodigal son had spent all, the scriptures say, there arose a famine in the land and he began to be in want. Driven by hunger and need, the son accepted that was unacceptable and offensive to, a, to the righteous Jewish person because swine were unclean under the law, according to Leviticus chapter 11, verse 7. No one gave him anything. The misery of the prod prodigal son moves our sympathy, yet his misery drove him to good resolution described in the following verse. And verse 17 says, Humiliated, the son finally realized that he was doing what he was doing, and he taught, there are many workers at my father's house who have all food. They want, who have all food, and they want with plenty to spare, and they lack nothing. So why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs, and eating their slop? I want to go back to my father's house, and I would like to say to my father, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I will never be worthy to be called your son. But please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. The fifth quality of the father is that the father acknowledges. The heart of the father acknowledges his son's confession. The child is humiliated. He has hit rock bottom. He finally realized what he has done and has come to his senses. The father acknowledges that it took courage for the son to arise and return to the father. It also took humility. Sometimes in our children's attempt to gain autonomy and independence, they lose focus 
and, 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 and they see the grass greener on the other side. And we also have to remember that at one time or the other, we might have walked away from our biological father or even our spiritual father, our heavenly father. And we might have gone drugging and, de and partying and, and, and we might have um, done all manners of things. And, and, and we finally, we ended up in a pig style. And be, because of that, you know, you're already struggling with, with um, you're already struggling with the pain and the guilt of your actions. And now you come, you return home. The last thing you want to hear is that anyone, your father giving you the riot act. And I am not condoning negative behaviors. But all I'm saying is that there are always consequences to your actions. And our children know what they have done. So let's change the negative narrative. And the, the father clearly illustrates love. You see, when, you, when we came to God, when you came to God, fathers, those fathers who know Jesus as Lord and Savior, after living a reckless and an uncontrolled life, uh, did, did God read you, read you the, uh, the riot act? Uh, did he outline all the bad things that you have ever done? Did he disgrace you? No, God acknowledged you with all your faults and he acknowledged you as his son. He said something like this, for this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the sixth quality of the father is the father absolves. It means that the father forgives. The heart of the father pardons and releases the son from his mistakes. The lost son demonstrated the repentance Jesus specifically spoke of in 1 John 1 verse 9. He said, if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and that he is just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The seventh quality of the father is the father accepts. Verse 20 says, from a long distance away, his father saw him coming, dressed as a beggar, and a great, with great compassion, swelled up in his heart for his son who was returning home. So the father raced out to meet him. He swept him in his arms, hugged him dearly, and kissed him all over again with, again with tender love. The father love waited and never forgot. It was a love that fully accepted his son. This was especially remarkable because the son had disgraced the family by prodigal living. And the eighth quality of the father is the father affirms. The father affirmed the, prod the prodigal sonship. The, the father said, quick, bring me a best robe, my very own robe. Bring me the ring. Bring me the best shoes and prepare a great feast. None of those four things brought the, the repentant prodigal were necessary. All were meant to honor him and to affirm the father's love towards him. In Malachi chapter 4, it states, And he shall return the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers. Least I come and smite the earth with a curse. In closing, church, my final encouragement to fathers is to endeavor to be approachable, be amendable, stay emotionally attached, always anticipate the best. Remember to acknowledge your child's effort. Be quick to absolve, be quick to forgive. Fully accept your child as a, not as a servant, but as a son, and genuinely affirm your children. At this time, I would just like to pray for fathers all over the world. Fathers, grandfathers, stepfathers, um, sons who are fathers, and the men in our lives who are fathers, uh, who are father figures. So if you could just join with me right now, church, and let us pray for our fathers. Our Father who art in heaven. Father, we, I thank you that we have you as a model father. And this day where the world and where uh, the in the United States and other parts of the world, we are paying tribute to our fathers. Father, I ask you that even now for a special blessing for our fathers. I especially pray for our brown and black fathers who it appears that for the past few months they have been under attack. 
Many children have lost their fathers to violence. I pray especially for those children this morning. And I pray for the father who has not yet accepted you as Lord and Savior. I pray you will reconcile that father to you through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray for the fathers who are incarcerated this morning, God. I pray for the fathers who are struggling with emotional detachment. Not because, God, they want to be emotionally detached, but because of their upbringing. But I pray even now that the heart of the father will be turned to the child. And the heart of the child will be turned to the father. I want to pray for my father, God, that you will save his precious soul. And I pray for my spiritual father, Bishop Eric McLeod, that you will continue, Lord, to use him in a mighty way, God, that you will strengthen him and empower him. And that he will know, God, that he is loved by the triumphant family. I lift up all fathers for you, to, unto you this morning, God. And I thank you for a special blessing upon the fathers. And even as you look at the fathers, God, right now, that you will say, these are my beloved sons in whom I am well pleased. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, let's give it up for the fathers today. Amen. What an awesome time we had in worship today. God has been good and God has been great to us. We're just so thankful that you were able to join us today and worship along with us. God is able. How many believe that? God is able to do above all that we can exceedingly ask or think. And we're grateful for him today. If you can, just hit the subscribe button on the right hand side of your screen. And beside that, hit the bell as well. And remember, live triumphantly. God bless you. Hallelujah. We serve a God that's exceeding and abundant above all we could ask or think. And we bless you today, Jesus. And we give you glory, honor, and praise forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.